Introducing the first forum of the fall term, not only because we have such a surfeit of glory on our panel, uh, uh, but, but, but also because it gives me an opportunity to introduce Seth Mnookin, who, is the, uh, who has agreed to take on the job of uh, co-director of the MIT Communications Forum. And I'm looking forward to many more sessions in, with, in which Seth moderates and helps uh, orchestrate the events of the forum. Uh, I won't uh, take the time to talk about Seth's own credentials, except to say uh, he seems a godsend to me, and I feel, I feel very fortunate to have him as a collaborator in continuing to create interesting forums. Uh, the, uh, the, website, uh, the forum website, which you can now see on the screen, lists our, uh, our other events for the semester. Uh, I hope they're there, and I hope I'll see you at those events as well. It remains for me only to say that those of you in the audience who have not uh, signed up for the MIT Communications Forum mailing list, please do so. We never give the list to anyone. We never send advertisements out. You never get any push <laughs> uh, ads on your uh, uh, urgings to download something you don't want. We only send out information about our events and you receive a very small number of emails, but you are kept in touch with the forum's activities. So please do sign up if you can. Seth. Thank you very much, David, and uh, thank you all from, for coming out. I know that um, there is a plethora of riches at MIT this afternoon, uh, but um, we hope that this will be time well spent. I'm going to very briefly introduce um, the four people who are on the panel. Uh, as I've told some of you out there, I know there are a lot of Phoenix alums out in the audience. Um, the selection of the panel was somewhat arbitrary, only in that uh, there are really an incredible number of incredible Phoenix alumni who are living in the area who we could have um, included. Uh, I took advantage of this as a chance to uh, collect some people that I wanted to hear from and talk to. Um, but a good portion of this next hour and 45 minutes will be spent uh, on audience questions and discussions and comments. Uh, and I hope that you all take advantage of that. Um, so, uh, the going from stage left to right, uh, the, is that right? Yes. Um, the, first, uh, um, the first person uh, seated is Lloyd Schwartz, who is the Frederick S. Troy Professor of English at UMass Boston. Uh, he is a longtime poet, um, and in addition to his three and a half works of poetry, uh, he is a particular expert on Elizabeth Bishop and has edited or co-edited um, several collections of her work. Uh, he started working at the Boston Phoenix in 1977 and worked there essentially straight through to this spring um, when the Phoenix went out of business uh, as the classical music critic and then classical music editor. Um, he also is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism uh, that he won in 1994 as a member of the Phoenix staff, um, after which he got a call from the New York Times asking them to immediately send his work to them and then never heard back. Uh, <laughs> next is Charlie Pierce, um, who uh, if you don't know already when he speaks, you will probably recognize his voice um, from his, uh, well, not just because he has a loud projected voice that you can hear around Boston, but from his <laughs> frequent um, appearances on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and Only a Game. Uh, he's the author of four books, including the 2009 bestseller, Idiot America. He was a Boston Globe Sunday Magazine staff writer for nine years, ending in 2011. Uh, he has been a writer at large at Esquire since 1997 and now writes Esquire's politics blog. Um, and also writes for as a staff writer at Grantland. Um, is it technically Grantland.com or just Grantland? Grantland.com, okay, um, which is a, a fantastic site. Um, uh, next along the line, we have Anita Diamond, who began as... No. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Short. Only next sorry. in my line, not <laughs> next in the actual line. Um, how dare you <laughs> not sit the way I typed you into my iPhone. Um, uh, next we have Carly Carioli, who I actually met 20-something um, uh, years ago, 20 years ago, um, when he, he, I think, was an intern at the Phoenix, and uh, I felt like I had 
broken into their offices and was writing a couple of arts reviews, some music reviews. Um, the music critics at the Phoenix were terrifying. I don't think that ever ended. And the biggest talking down I ever received was uh, in a review of a, of a Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend concert. I misidentified one of the members of the backing band um, uh, as the wrong relationship to Pete Townsend and his family. Um, and it was as if I had spelled the president's name wrong. Uh, Carly um, has been at the Phoenix straight through since he started as an intern, uh, did the listings, um, was a listings editor, was a calendar editor, um, then went on to be an editor and eventually the editor uh, of the Phoenix, um, first on the website and then of the newspaper and finally of the magazine. Uh, he was the final editor of the Phoenix um, and is now at Boston Magazine and uh, I will probably not embarrass him by quoting some of the things he said about Boston Magazine over the years <laughs> in the pages of the Phoenix. <laughs> Globe did the same thing to me. It was horrible. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Carly was briefly worked at the Globe before he went to Boston Magazine, and uh, he also had some not great things to say about them over the years. Um, next, finally, is Anita. Uh, and um, Anita began uh, as an assistant to the editor, is that right, at the Phoenix in 1978? Um, and stayed there until 1983, which actually I skipped this over with Charlie, but is the exact same time frame uh, that Charlie was at the Phoenix. Um, totally coincidental, they assure me. Uh, she um, started out writing profiles and eventually a first person column um, at the Phoenix, in addition to writing a lot about um, feminist issues, about religion, um, about personal issues, uh, um, and since she's left the Phoenix, has become uh, a best-selling author several times over, most notably of 1997's The Red Tent. Um, her most recent book is 2009's Day After Night. Uh, and somehow, in between all that, she found time to be a staff writer at the Boston Globe magazine for 10 years, um, uh, back when the Boston Globe magazine was still running long stories. Um, so that's the four of them. Um, uh, as I said, I'm going to try and direct the conversation for the first 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I'm going to interpret my job as mainly being one to, to get out of the way. Um, uh, so what, I want to start, Carly, with you, um, just because you were there at the end. Uh, and I know you've said that you were surprised um, on the day that it happened, because I think it, it, the actual announcement came without a huge amount of warning. Um, but was that something that you were surprised about in, in a larger sense when it happened? Uh, oh, wait, oh. don't talk yet. Okay. Uh, one last thing. Um, if you're live blogging, um, the hashtag uh, is PhoenixMIT, P-H-E-O-N-I-X-M-I-T. P-H. Yeah, however you spell Phoenix, yeah. then <laughs> followed by MIT. <laughs> right. <laughs> Here, there. Okay, so, Carly. Uh, the question was, was I surprised? Um, I, think, uh, I think a lot of us understood that the paper, um, especially once we switched from a newspaper to a magazine, um, what that we were doing, um, sort of an experiment that... Um, and just back up for one second, and so the, the Phoenix had been um, a newspaper, uh, primarily a broadsheet for uh, most of its existence since it started um, in the late 60s or early 70s, depending on when you date its inception. Uh, and then what, what changes happened in its format over the last couple of years? Um, uh, so, I mean, it went from the broadsheet, obviously, to sort of the tabloidy thing. This is, these are actually the, the Portland and Providence Phoenixes, which are still around. Um, and we, have a, we had it delivered by an actual Mindich. Um, to our, to this, you just came out today, this fall preview. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the date. I think it was, I guess, the early part of, it was like the, it was like September of 2012, maybe, somewhere in there, where we, um, we were um, given the ultimatum to, over the course of six weeks, turn this 46-year-old newspaper into a glossy magazine. Um, and that was because, um, uh, the finances were not great. Um, the finances of newspapers in general hadn't been great. Um, we'd survived a lot of um, downturns in the industry, um, but the Phoenix was um, 
by all accounts losing um, still losing a pretty a pretty big amount of money and um, so as, a, as kind of a last ditch attempt to uh, to revive the brand we sort of um, came up with this this crazy notion to combine um, the Phoenix and um, and our glossy lifestyle magazine stuff magazine into a single publication that would be weekly um, and try and keep as much of um, the Phoenix's identity as we could and we relaunched that after a, sort of a under a, um, insane conditions where our offices were also being renovated and there were jackhammers and we were putting together this thing that we'd never done before. Um, so the magazine came out. Um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I think we were all pretty proud of it. Um, it was all done. And the entire thing was done. It was designed in-house. It was, you know, um, sort of built from scratch. And, um, and then um, and things seemed to be going well, especially at the beginning. Um, it was fat. Um, people seemed to like it. Um, and then, but we, but I, I guess my point was that at that point we understood that um, that that was an experiment that, and that we had probably, you know, a limited amount of time to try and make that work. And and Stephen Mindish, the publisher of the Phoenix, sort of made that um, clear to um, to many of us who had sort of been there for a long time. So, um, you know, it, the reason that it wasn't a total shock, um, we were still surprised at the timing. We thought we had more time, um, but um, the magazine itself. Um, was getting sort of thinner and thinner, um, and the advertising pages just weren't there. So, um, in that sense, it, it um, you know, it, it began to take on a kind of an, an inevitability. But, um, but even at the end, it was it was still kind of a, a shock. Even now, it's still kind of a shock. Um, and and Charlie uh, and Anita, um, you can both jump in on this, but. We, when we were talking just before the forum started, we were talking about some of the ways in which um, the Phoenix covered the news and the types of things that the Phoenix covered that was distinct from what was happening at the Globe or any place else uh, locally. Can you talk a little bit about that? No, you start. Come on, Charlie. They came to hear you. Come on. <laughs> I, what I did there for five years, which was essentially right for the news section, although I did do a number of things for lifestyle and for the supplements, because I was writing for my rent. So and the more words I wrote, the easier it was to pay the rent. But we were sort of, I thought we were sort of the first generation produced <laughs> by the long-form narrative nonfiction that came out of New York in the 1970s, the, the stuff that Tom Wolfe put in an anthology called The New Journalism, although it wasn't really new. And are you, are you talking about New York Magazine I'm or just... About, I'm talking about yeah, New York Magazine, Harper's under, Harper's under Willie right. Morris, uh, Esquire, Esquire under the latter days of Hughes and, you know, and so forth. And I think that uh, we were sort of the, the next generation of that. We, we, covered, we covered almost everything the Globe covered, but we did it at length and we did it with voice and we did it with attitude. A terrible word, but that's what it was. Uh, and we, at least when I got there in 1978, it had already carved out a niche within the media biosphere in Boston for that kind of thing. I can't speak to the arts coverage, although I know we were, you know, the, the arts coverage was brilliant, and Lloyd can talk to that. But from our side of it, I would go out and write long impressionistic pieces from the campaign trail or from, <coughs> or about, you know, the guy, I, I did the, a piece, a long piece about the last, uh, porno house in Chelsea, where I had to go with a 70-year-old ju judge and a whole bunch of jurors who I don't think have ever recovered to go watch a movie, <laughs> so they could so they could witness the evidence. Do you remember the movie? I do not. I do not remember the movie. Uh, uh, the judge's name was Rudolph Stanziani. I remember that, <laughs> but I do not remember the movie. But it was back in the days where they had plots and so forth. But and, and anyway, that's what I that's what I thought we were. That's what I that's what I came there to do. Uh, and I think, you know, for the balance of the time I was there, that's what we did. And, uh, you know, subsequently, I think a lot of that got absorbed into dailies, but at the time, we were the ones who, I mean, the New York, the Washington Post style section was doing it, but hardly anybody else was doing it around the country in dailies. Um, <laughs> I, um, I started out answering the phone and filing photographs, which is pretty much how women got into the news, newsroom, anyway. Um, I don't know how the arts section worked. But. And, and this was, so just to remind everyone, so in the late 70s, um, for you felt still to get into the newsroom, and by that point you had been a journalist for a couple well, of well, years. Well, I was a freelancer. No, I had been a freelancer, and I'd written for 
um, Equal Times, which was a, a women's bi-weekly that had li lived for several years, and I equal time. wrote everything in there <laughs> under many names. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I learned a lot. Um, and uh, no, I thought Renee Loth had the job of assistant to the editor. Renee Loth, um, who many of you may know, was a state house, brilliant state house reporter. Um, she was at that desk briefly, and she went right to the state house and um, became the editor, the editorial page editor of the Globe most recently. And so that I got the job after that. And um, um, I remember we had a file called "Phone Calls from the Dead," that were you know we got really strange phone calls and. Um, <laughs> And it was it was my way, and I then I wrote over the handed things in over the transom um, to Bob Sales, who was the first editor who um, really taught me how to write in a lot of ways, um, and Richard Gaines, and then Andy Zellman, who was the lifestyle editor who had started by answering the phones at the front desk, um, uh, took me out to lunch and said that I had more opinions than anyone she'd ever met, <laughs> and she and she offered me a column, uh, which was amazing and I got to write whatever I wanted uh, which the, and the freedom of that was remarkable and I think um, I think what I was doing and what a lot of us were doing at that time was reinventing the women's pages um, that the that the lifestyle section had its own uh, footprint uh, and, and when, when you say women's pages, it's not that there were literally women's pages in the Phoenix. But no, more it was it was the, it was this, the that, soft stuff, right, right. Um, which the women's movement had identified as core important stuff that needed to be covered, and that included um, everything from women's health to fashion to um, to politics and the way women were discussed in the media, um, and with humor and with attitude and also with integrity in terms of reporting. So I felt, one of the things I, I felt that the Phoenix always did with whatever attitude was that we had to do the work, we had to do the reporting, and that the facts had to be there. And so that um, whenever people sort of, you know, raised an eyebrow about the Phoenix, it was like, it's really, it's yeah. good journalism. The it was solid, it was really, all of it was solid, and the lifestyle section was solid and had news in it as well. And so I just pulled up your, your porn again um, oh. piece. It actually is not from 2006. Uh, it's from oh. 1982, <laughs> I think. Is that right? Does that sound right? Sounds right. Which was um, uh, a piece you wrote, um, a great piece, about uh, a debate between Andrea Dworkin um, and Alan Dershowitz. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> uh, which which, which I, I should point out, when the Phoenix um, ran it in their flashback section in 2006, Alan Dershowitz wrote in again. Uh, it's true. It's 14 true. years later to, to, to <laughs> correct the record, to correct what he thought. I've been on was panels with him since then, and he's absolutely the same yes. person. Um, uh, but, but so I, 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 I just want to dig down. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that happened all the time. You would, you would, people would get something in their teeth, and they would not let it go. Yeah. yeah. And that's what uh, Phone Calls from the Dead was about, yeah, too. Yeah, people, yeah. But so, you know, we're talking about how um, the Phoenix was, and, and alt weeklies, I think, uh, in general, certainly the voice during the late 70s, early 80s, was doing um, long form reportage. Uh, but I also want to just get at some of the distinctions between the actual subject matter. So, was this something that you would see covered or written about in this way in the globe or in oh. any other <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and I think and this was just a, this was a huge event. I mean there were there were a lot of people there, there. was concerns about violence, there was <laughs> there was a lot that, going right. on there. And I, I don't remember if there was globe coverage, but I I I know that we did much long, many more inches uh, and um, and I was given uh, a lot of space and time as much as I needed and support to do this. And I actually think part of what we did um, in the lifestyle section was I'd take stories that, that the women's movement and feminism had identified and, um, and actually elevate them to some extent by making them uh, well-reported, well-written, and not screeds. Um, and uh, and also and that gave it more legitimacy, I think. I think the content got, had more legitimacy I think it was I think, written that way. I think that's an important point. We almost wrote, no, there were almost no straight opinion pieces at the Phoenix when I was there. What are people looking at? Oh. <laughs> Pornography. Kind of a... <laughs> we have a theme going. I, I got a kind of Zapruder thing going here with my neck. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we, the, 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 the stories and the reporting was full, of, was full of, of analysis and interpretation and opinion. But there were almost, there were very few... As Anita said, screeds. I mean, there were. I mean, there were. There was an occasion. There were. There were columns that were clearly designated as columns. 
Phoenix editorials didn't come in until till almost the time I was leaving. Uh, but the distinction between allowing a guy to go, I mean, what, you know, the, the thing that, you know, and I don't want to go off on political reporting, but the, on, the, on the one hand, on the other hand, thing didn't exist yeah. at the Phoenix. It just didn't happen. The, you know, faux balance didn't happen. We were, I mean, our politics were left. There was no question about that. But at the same time, I think I did a lot of work with Republicans just at the beginning of the Reagan administration, just as the, what was the, and, and I also did a, a piece on a thing called Washington for Jesus, which was the first major rally of what became the religious right. And they were, as, we were willing to be fair. We weren't going to, I mean, we, I mean, we were never going to agree with these folks. But they would, I would get my phone calls returned from Republicans and from the people of Washington for Jesus because they knew that basically I was willing to listen to them for a half an hour and use, and, and, and use whatever I could as part of my reporting. But there were very, very few straight out yell in your face kind of screeds. And I, 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 I pulled up Alan's uh, letter um, in 2006, and the reason was just because he quotes the Globe article that covered this. And what's interesting is, um, I think, Anita, your piece was uh, oh, yes, much less, did not try and hide opinion as fact. It presented a much more complete picture of the facts, and um, you could draw your interpretations from that. Uh, and the Globe um, did almost the exact opposite, and it described it as uh, what these men and women saw, and some of them created, was an ugly collision between 40 enraged radical feminists and Dershowitz who defended free speech and became a symbol for the entire legal system, which I think you would be hard-pressed to draw that conclusion from Alan your... was an asshole. <laughs> Alan was horrible, That's... and people reacted. So. Right. Um, but, but let me just, one last thing that I wrote a, an opinion column, it was in my name, but I had to report, I had to support my opinions with reporting. Um, and I was told to go back and get, yeah. get a quote from somebody that I couldn't just say that, that I had to support it with either, you know, a citation from somewhere. And I, I, that, that was, I don't see that anywhere very much anymore. Uh, yeah, we were, we were gifted with tremendous, tremendous editors, and I don't, mean strictly the editors of the newspaper, although certainly Bob Sales, Anita and I owe Bob Sales a debt that we can never repay. But I'm talking about things like people like David Moran, who's here, uh, Tom Frail, the late John Ferguson, God, the late Cliff Garboden, I'm going to go down the little... Kit Rackless. Kit Rackless. They worked you, and I have been through a bunch of different magazines since then, Nobody worked and you. nobody worked me harder than those guys did. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you. Esquire is a, is a breeze compared to submitting a, a piece to David or John or Tommy was, because it was. I mean, you had to have done your, your due diligence, and it was a great training ground. It was a great training ground for accepting the fundamental necessity of editors, which writers don't often do very well. Uh, but uh, I think that was very important, and I think and he, I didn't realize that about the column either because I never had a column. But yeah, I mean, it was it was it was a it was a gauntlet, and you had and you had to run it, and it was terrific. Lloyd, I, I want to um, jump over to what I think uh, a lot of people saw as one of the defining features of the Phoenix um, throughout all of its incarnations, and that's the, the arts coverage. Um, uh, it was where, growing up in Boston, I learned almost everything I knew about music. Um, and I think one thing that really distinguished the Phoenix um, from the Globe and from the way newspapers generally were covering the arts is it wasn't enough that you were interested in something. You had to really have a deep well of knowledge to um, be deemed appropriate to, to criticize it. Is that... Well, this was true of the arts section, and, and, and it, it began by being true because there was so much space available. I mean, I, I, my favorite figure... So you couldn't go on for 3,000 words if you didn't know what you were talking right. about. Right, <laughs> and I'm thinking of the person who, did, could, go, who did go on for 3,000 words was Stephen Schiff, who was the, <laughs> who was the Phoenix m movie critic, movie editor, and who was sort of notorious for going on talking about a new film or an old film that would take up three entire Phoenix pages and in the days when the Phoenix was actually bigger than it 
than it became. And, but and ten point type also probably. <laughs> <laughs> that I, that I don't remember. I could still read it in those, <laughs> in those days. Um, but we really were. No one was given a space limit. And it was a kind, it was an amazing kind of freedom to have. And I don't think anyone took advantage of that in the worst way. That is, people who, <laughs> but that people who wrote about the arts in Boston, and this meant rock music because we had, I think, short of maybe or along with Rolling Stone, we had the best rock critics in the country. And movies, serious... Who, who were some of those critics who then, because I was thinking about trying to list all of the Phoenix critics that had gone on to national prominence, and we just could have spent the entire hour doing that, but... During that period, who were some of those critics? Well, Kit Rackless, uh, who then became an editor of the L.A. Times Magazine and L.A. Weekly, and the, his, there's a very, very long list, and this is like the thing that terrifies me. Milo Miles, like, Milo he, Miles, he's today. He here. Um, yeah, uh, and, I mean, so I mean, like, I mean, Mark yeah. Moses. Uh, but that entire Rolling Stone staff, I think, at that time, I mean, the, the original Rolling Stone crew was, was also running for the Phoenix. You have, like, Dave Marsh back there, and, and you know, Chris Gow was in there occasionally. And, um, I mean, we found Lester Bangs pieces back in the archives. I mean, just this, uh, anybody who was anybody, just one? Just one? I saw... You <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, too, because the same, he ran the same, we figured out he ran the same piece, like, a year later somewhere else, and somebody else had, like, you know, obviously not edited him. So, so with the Phoenix version was a much better edited piece. It goes to <laughs> Charlie's point. Um, but, I mean, reading through those archives is just astonishing. I mean, Kit Rackless, um, who is now the editor of the American Prospect, I met him at a conference. He's got white hair. He looks very distinguished. He um, was in Atlanta when the Sex Pistols landed for their first U.S. show, and, and there's, you know, the, there's the Phoenix Review of the first Sex Pistols show in America, which always astonished me. Um, but that, that legacy is really, really deep. And, and not only that, it, it um, you know, I can say certainly when I got there in 1993, sort of echoing um, Charlie's stories about becoming a writer there, um, there was no greater place on earth to like learn your craft. Mm -hmm. um, I, I showed up to Phoenix, um, a kid from Philadelphia with hair down to his ass who knew nothing about anything except that is um, actually true. heavy metal and um, a little bit about punk rock. Um, and the editors there were John Gorelick, who's here, uh, Ted Drasowski, who um, made me roadie for his band, that's how I got the gig, and, um, and Matt Asher, who, who seemed to know everybody in town and had played in bands with people. And, um, and that sort of um, apprenticeship uh, for four years of just sort of you know, walking into a, a room where people would tell you what to read and what to listen to and what magazines and what writers, and um, that was, you know, that was constant. That was something that, you know, was, that was your sort of, um, your day-to-day -day thing was just talking about music and arguing about music and, and, and film and, and current and Current rock music, popular music, uh, was certainly the center and, and always got the most attention uh, at the, in the Phoenix art section. What is fascinating and what I am, you know, un, you know, I will always be grateful for is that there was always room, there was always the desire to also include, you know, the, the high culture issues. There were, so there were, you know, brilliant rock, uh, brilliant art critics, David Benetti, who is also here uh, um, today, uh, Carolyn Clay uh, writing about theater, uh, some, you know, people with authoritative voices. And the fact that the Phoenix was actually interested in having reviews of classical music and having serious coverage of classical music. Richard Buell, uh, before my time, uh, whom I essentially replaced, uh, uh, you know, and that 
that even when the phoenix was shrinking in those last days and and probably the number of people who actually read classical music reviews was also shrinking that that Steve Mindich and the editors actually s continued to want that aspect that for me crucial aspect of of Boston culture in the paper was a, a real testament to the, the kind of seriousness of what it meant to be interested in the arts and living in Boston. And well, so I think one of the things that, that does and did distinguish the Phoenix was this um, mix of, of almost equal emphasis on high-low mm -hmm. um, in terms of the arts and engaging with them with a similar depth of meaning. So here I came to the Phoenix after having written for the Herald for three years. Speaking of high art. Speaking of high art, where, where I had no space and had to turn in reviews without thinking about them because they were due the night of the concert. Nobody, not, not even the Herald does that anymore, or, the, or the, certainly not the Globe. Uh, and, and then being butchered by, especially by the weekend editors. I mean, really changing things and making mistakes and uh, continual embarrassment, although it was a great, that was my apprenticeship. And then coming to the Phoenix, where I'm actually asked to write essays about music and getting the most serious uh, uh, responses from the editors. I mean, David Moran was certainly here today with someone who actually knew and was interested in classical music. The person who was editing me most at the time was Kit Rackless, who was a rock critic and who really didn't know much about classical music, but who really wanted to make sure that he could understand what I was talking about and that I was really backing up everything that I had to say. I had a lot of opinions and and I really had to support those opinions. Those opinions, the opinions of the people writing about arts, weren't necessarily the most popular opinions. For me, it was my profoundly and increasingly serious reservations about Seiji Ozawa being, being the music director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the most important classical music institution in, you know, in, in certainly in this area, outside of New York in the East. And even the Globe, I mean, the, you know, there were very good critics writing for the Globe. But there was a kind of pressure coming from the higher ups at the Globe that you really had to be very careful about what you said about the major institutions. And this was not the case at the Phoenix. And I, 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 I think I was, um, that it was important to say that the emperor had no clothes. So I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about what we think or what you all think uh, is going to be missing from the Boston intellectual and, and journalistic scene uh, now that the Phoenix is gone. And I'll preface that by saying that one of the things that it seemed to me um, as an outsider that occurred over the last decade or so was you had the globe increasingly um, either appropriating or exploring some of the areas that the Phoenix did, probably best represented by uh, the ideas section, um, which uh, uh, I don't know if they hired Peter Canales, Gareth, and Steve Heuser all at the same time, um, but essentially just took a bunch of Phoenix editors and, and had them make uh, their own section. Um, I know Stephen would be here tonight, but he's closing that section at the moment. Um, uh, and so in addition to that, you had a lot of what was being covered by Alt Weeklies in the arts um, moving over to the internet. So 
despite the fact that we all will miss the Phoenix and, and, and it was integral um, in our lives, what are we actually going to be missing in Boston now that it's gone? You're missing, I mean, just to start, you're missing really terrific writers getting really seriously edited by brilliant editors. And there was, there's just nothing else like that. I, and it's certainly not on the internet. And um, I, don't, I don't see it, I don't see it any place else. Carly? Uh, not in the Times. Excuse yeah, me. I mean, I, I, I felt I, I, the, the trend you're describing of the, of the globe sort of trying to veer into pop culture coverage and the, and the, and the web, those, those things definitely happen. Um, I, not, not, but, I mean, not just the globe, but, you know, the Times sure, has I mean, done the, that much more successfully. One of the things that I, you know, that I used to say is that uh, to, the, to sort of the alt-media crowd is that, you know, the alternative media won. The idea was that there mm -hmm. was this once this hegemony of the, of the mainstream media and that the alternative media was encroaching and sort of breaking up that, that pseudo-monopoly. Um, it did that, and the Internet, when it sort of began to develop its own voice, took many elements of the, of the alternative weekly style. Um, I, think that's, I think that's true. But... Um, to Lloyd's point, um, there was a ton of stuff that, I mean, there's a, there were, many of us have gone off and, and, and gone different places, but there are also, there were voices that I cared deeply about, even um, in the very last Phoenix. Um, two of them are here, um, that, uh, that you won't see anywhere on Boston. You won't see Liz Pelly writing about underground music and, you know, and, and underground activism. You won't see Maddie Myers writing about, you know, feminist video game critics. Like, nobody's doing that in Boston. Um, and they're both doing astounding work um, in other places, um, but not, but not for the Globe, and not for, not for Boston Magazine, and not for um, any of the places that, that we represent. Although I, I, I assume that those places are um, available online, so functionally, are they doing it for a Boston audience? Well, I mean, sure. I mean, Liz Pelly started a you know an advertising free um, you know alt weekly inspired online thing called um, Fuck the Media, which was amazing, and still is amazing. Um, and, and, and Maddie's stuff is obviously available, I mean, um, online, but, um, you know, she's also writing a book. So, I mean, you know, it, it depends on exactly what you think, you know, what, what the, if you want that at length, um, and is that sustainable? You're talking about two people who were getting paychecks from the Phoenix and are not getting paychecks now. And, and you know, for, for people to sort of provide a space for writers like that to, to hone their craft and learn how to be writers, that, I mean, there's an entire generation of kids who just aren't going to get to do that. Um, and with all respect to The Dig, which is a great paper, um, it's not particularly sustainable at this point. I mean, they're not paying people um, the same way that, that we were, and they don't have the kind of scope that can, they can sort of pick up the slack. I hope they are able to grow into something that can do that. That would be great. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think there's a huge hole. And, and Anita, I know you said that you had not been a reader of the Phoenix recently. Do you think that's because you you aged out, or because you were getting what you had been looking to the Phoenix for elsewhere? Um, yes and no. I think I did age out, but I didn't see the Phoenix anymore. And we were talking about that when it stopped being sold, I stopped seeing it. And that so it, and it stopped being sold. I think we figured roughly in in the mid '90s. Is yeah. that right? Mid or late '90s? It went from was it a buck fifty at that point? Is that yes. Sound right? So it went from being a, a buck fifty to following the model that virtually by that point every other alt weekly had um, taken on, including The Voice, which was free distribution. Right. And that meant, and that sort of felt like, well, you're too old for this because this is on college campuses for the most part. That's what it felt like anyway. Even though I knew that there were, and every now and then I would pick it up and read Lloyd or Carolyn Clay, who I really, who's, I, I think was, still is the best theater critic in town. Um, but, you know, but then I didn't see it again for another six months or eight months. And I, so I felt, you know, that the hands were somewhat washed. And, uh, and then there were other places. And I do think the alternative media won in terms of adding more voices to the mainstream press um, and to broadening what, what's covered in the mainstream press. And, of course, then the Internet came, in, came along and picked up everything. Um, I'm sorry about the uh, – I'm sorry to not have known about the, um, the video game reviews because I've started reading them in the Times and I'm realizing there's this whole universe that I need to learn more about. Wait, um, why do you need to learn more about it? Because it's there. <laughs> because it's there. Just because I, and because I'm interested in what women are doing with it and I, and I was trying to follow that a little bit. But that's not happening in, locally anywhere else that I'm aware of. So now I'm going to have to figure out the website. But, um, but it's, 
it is out there. What's missing is, of course, an address for all of this stuff, um, an address to find Lloyd's, what Lloyd's writing and, and, what, and what other really talented people are writing, which is going to be somewhere on the internet. And Charlie and I were talking about this. The, the internet is a baby. We have no idea what's going to happen with it and how it's going to coalesce and how branding is going to work and, um, how we, and how we're going to start finding things in the future. And it's, um, it, scares, it sort of scares the crap out of paper people. But um, it, we, it's, we won't know for quite, for quite some time how it's going to shake out and how, how we will find addresses and how people who um, need long form and deserve long form can, um, can find their audiences out there. What's frustrating is that there's so much and you don't know how to get it. And um, so it'll change. Yeah, but I, I want to go back to something Carly mentioned right at the end, uh, which is an odd place for me to be now because I am almost entirely on, all my work is entirely done on the web now pretty much. I do an occasional piece for the Dead Tree version of Esquire. But I work in a world of very young people. I do not, I have not, since I left the Globe magazine and moved on to the internet, I haven't had an editor who's 30 years old yet. I mean, I have socks that are older than every <laughs> editor. I, I, I'm wearing some now. Uh, but I do think that there's something to be said for the woodshedding you have to do early in your career, as you, especially as, as a writer, as you develop yourself. And to get, you know, a piece chucked at, back at you a couple times by David Moran or, 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 or John Ferguson or somebody, uh, and, 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 and to develop your craft as a writer. And I see that sort of lacking in web-based journalism. Uh, I'm sure it'll develop uh, as, as, as the, this, as Anita said, baby grows up. But I know that I would not be whatever I am without having gone through this process. And I think that was, for me, that was the most valuable part about being at the Phoenix, mm -hmm. was, was I walked out of the Phoenix in 1983 knowing everything I needed to know about making a career and what I did. Uh, everything else was refinement. And I think that's what, if you're asking what, hole, what, what the hole is, that's the hole. So it's finishing school. Exactly. Well, well that may be the first school. time the Phoenix finishing. has ever been described as, as finishing school. <laughs> <laughs> graduate school. People usually call it a graduate school. Right. <laughs> Seth, Seth, can I just correct a little bit of history quickly? Sure. Yes, you can grab the mic. And we will in about eight I minutes. Don't, I don't want to start going on on anything. I'm, I'm David Murray. And the 10 years before these distinguished people were there, there was an entire history of the paper, not right. just the rock critics, yeah, yeah. but the entire the way that we were blessed to have sensationally talented people come in like Lloyd, Charlie, and Anita, all had predecessors. 10 years of predecessors. I don't think, I'm, I'm certainly okay, not we, we, in fact, that, No, no, but and, fact, and I'm Anita, just saying there were... Fact, yeah. In fact, Anita and I came in at oh. a moment of great transition. Yeah. Right. Howard no, Usox, Duke but Cullen. My only point yeah. was when we're talking about names or trying yeah. to reach right. from Robert Christgau or names that weren't really part of the Phoenix, but I was hired by Bill Miller, who was still alive. He was a Globe News guy. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who hired Frail and Ferguson. Um, and it is Bill Miller and Ken Emerson before me in the arts, and all of these, and Ben Gerson before Ken Emerson, and we also, the only other historical footnote I'll say is, we had dozens of women, none of whom started by answering the phone. There was no, there's somebody's blogging and saying that Nita had to, and Nita didn't have to answer the phone. People came in wanting to answer the phone. I wanted to answer the phone. It was my way uh, in. Yeah, no, uh, we were, I mean, to get someone insanely overeducated like Anita, who wanted to join the paper, Paper, that's fine, but there are 15 Anitas before Anita, and there were feminist columnists, Karen Lindsay, Kerry Grusin was an early editor before my time. So from 66 to 76. We're not going to, we're yeah. just, So yeah. I'm just, from 66 to 77, let us say. Oh, yeah, we, we. There's an entire momentum into which, I mean, you can step in the same river twice. I, I, one, of, one of the challenges of putting this together was figuring out how you encompass almost a half century's worth of history um, uh, with a tiny handful of people in over a small amount of time. And, and, and I was about to say, while David was talking, in 78, 79, when I got there and Anita got there, the staff was undergoing a great transition. A lot of the people David's talking about were leaving. Diane Dumanowski left. Okay. Diane Dumanowski, Howard Husak, Stu Cohen. Richard Gaines became the editor, uh, having done magnificent work as a statehouse reporter. 
Uh, so there was a lot of room for, there were, there were huge shoes for us to, to step into, and we jumped into them with both feet, to really torture the metaphor. But there was an enormous, there was an enormous transition right between 1978 and I, I never met Bill Miller. I was hired, you know, he, he preceded Bob Sales. And, uh, you know, there were a few constants, Dave O'Brien, George Kimball, who we have not mentioned up until this point, and that's too bad. Uh, you know, and, and I think Tom Sheehan was already there. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, but if if, I, I, if we if we name checked, um, we could we would literally be here till ten o'clock. Okay. Uh, um, everyone at the Phoenix, and it's not it's not not to give everyone props. Um, no, but I'm just I'm just pointing out that there was this this very kind of great energy and turnover in this thing. I mean, it was it was a it was as as we've all shown, it was a great place to work your way up to the. To, to what Cer you wanted to be, but with that also came along with this. The, we used to have these massive turnovers. I mean, by, it was by again, the, it was healthy. It wasn't. The, it wasn't. You know, by the by the seventies, certainly. I mean, the 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 voice is, um, uh, you know, rightfully cited as um, sort of the first big metro alt weekly. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that the Phoenix was really the second big um, metro alt weekly, and a lot of the innovations that came to the form, uh, came out of Boston and, and out of the Phoenix, um, uh, and the sort of New York oxygen sometimes, I think, uh, um, overlooks that. So th I, I do want to make sure that we touch on one last thing before we open it up, and that's um, uh, this sense of um, the attitude of the Phoenix um, or of Alt Weeklies in general uh, shifting to the mainstream, so the notion that the Alt Weeklies won, um, and what that really means and what was lost in that transition. And I'll explain a little bit um, what I'm talking about. Uh, Dan Kennedy, who is here also, um, and, uh, uh, and right here, uh, and was worked at the Phoenix for a long time and is now a media critic, um, wrote something that I thought was very interesting when during during uh, one of the uh, uh, pieces written in the immediate aftermath and that was um, he said the community that sustained the Phoenix has passed from the scene at one time the Boston area was a wash in concert venues record stores guitar emporiums independent bookstores head shops the kind of businesses that reach their customers by advertising in alternative weeklies and the reason I thought that was interesting was because uh, you know you look at Harvard Square um, and what has happened there over the last 20 years and how that is now a magnet for tourists in a way that it wasn't. And so on the one hand, you could say, well, this downtown Cambridge attitude has sort of taken over. On the other hand, the taste is gone, the worst house is gone. Um, uh, you have a bunch of banks and chain stores in their place. So are we seeing with um, the passing of the Phoenix, the sort of culmination of what has been this now ongoing trend of the kind of edges being shorn off of what we thought of as an alternative culture um, uh, and, and kind of repackaged for, for malls and, and mainstream America in 30 oh. seconds or less. No, I mean, I mean it kind of, kind of, I mean, twas ever thus though, right? I mean, you know, you, you know something becomes popular in the underground and people on the overground realize it can sell and then they start selling it. I mean, uh, I what, whatever. I, I just distrust nostalgia, and this is getting into nostalgia for me. And you know, yeah, oh, I mean, the, the good old days of the head shops. And um, no, I, I, I just I think, think I, I, I just I just think what, what whatever will come next is whatever the alternative uh, to the present is. Yeah. Which right. is what the whole you know it may well you know I, I have no idea what that will be. I, 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 I was a constant enemy. <laughs> at the Phoenix. I mean, the part of the part of the the ever presentness of the Phoenix was its constant reinvention of itself over and over and over again. The, the name was sort of good about that. You're you're asking about whether or not there was a sustainable thing there. I actually disagreed with Dan a, a bit about about what he wrote. Um, in, in in a way, in a broad sense, he's not wrong. I mean, you, you're you're those are accurate changes. But um, but I also sort of was trying to point out that there that a lot of the you know, a lot of the things that people I sort of identified with the older Phoenix, you know, those things evolved as well. I mean, there were, you know, there, there were things in Boston that are much more profitable than sort of some of the underground things were. If you look at a, a business like Karma Loop, like, you know, this is a streetwear company that is now worth, you know, millions and millions of dollars, um, you know, is sort of taken over for like maybe what Newberry Comics was in the 90s or, you know, what sort of your head shop was in the 70s. I'm not sure that there, I, I think, you know, there's, you can sort of go a little bit too far and say that the audience for that 
um, evaporate. I, I certainly felt um, a renewal, especially in the last five years of the, of the newspaper, um, that I think had been sort of absent for maybe more than a decade um, with, you know, the, uh, sort of a, a reflowering of certainly like, you know, DIY and punk culture in Boston. And, um, and sort of, and surprisingly, like a real strong base of activism that sort of had been absent for a lot of my tenure there. I, I'm not saying that, um, uh, you know, head shops and, and guitar stores were good or bad. <laughs> um, I was just uh, making a comment about that generally. And I do think that one thing that, um, that the Phoenix was able to seize on as its own was a sort of part of um, Boston and a part of life that you wouldn't see in the globe because it made people uncomfortable. And there just is, it seems to me, that in the same way that um, Boston is a safer city than it has ever been, um, uh, you know, I remember being shocked when I, our, our, a school field trip drove through the combat zone. Um, you don't have, there aren't really any areas in the city in what, today in which you would feel like you had to cover up your kids' eyes when you were driving through. That, I have kids, so I'm happy about that. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should return to that. that. I'll throw that comment to Chris Verone. Is Chris Verone here? He is here. He was. He's nodded, he's nodded off. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's necessary. I mean, yeah, it's a safer city, but I, I, I don't know that there's, that that means that there's nothing, is, is this like a Jane's Addiction thing? Is there nothing shocking? I, I, don't, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think there were still stories that, that you can tell that, that differentiate yourself from. Well, so, you, you know, Anita, your story about that, um, uh, the Andrea Dworkin, uh, um, uh, Alan Dershowitz debate, and the way that you talked about what was actually going on there instead of talked about it euphemistically, or Charlie, um, uh, your fantastic quote, was it Daryl Dawkins? Yeah. That you cited um, uh, when, uh, when the 76ers beat the Celtics and a, a, a chant of beat LA went up in the Boston Garden and the Globe sports reporter asked Daryl Dawkins what that was like and he said, um, when I heard that, my dick got stiff. And uh, he, he, he turned to the Phoenix reporter and said, Bob Ryan we gave it to Michael Gee. You run this because we're not going to be able to. Um, <laughs> and it was Michael's lead. Uh, um, but, but in terms of, so, so you know, still, you, you're, you're not going to see cursing in the pages of the Globe. But in terms of subject matter, are there things today that, and maybe Carly, this, is, this can be the final question of this part. For, for, for you, or Charlie, you can also jump in, but are there things today that the Phoenix was covering that no one else would cover? Chris Farone on Occupy. I mean, nobody covered Occupy the way he did. Nobody but, in America but, covered the Occupy movement the way that guy did. That was, I mean, you find your alternative. I mean, the, 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 thing, the thing about this, this business is there will always be a mainstream, therefore there will always, always be an alternative. But you just that, have to go find it. Was that a failure of the fact that no one else covered it like Chris did, and I agree with that, is that because if Chris had been working for um, a, quote, mainstream publication, they wouldn't have run it because they weren't interested or just because they didn't have Chris? They, 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 would have, they wouldn't have run it because it wasn't within their comprehension to cover it that way. Yeah, I mean, there was, and, and just to, to shout out, the other people who covered that for us, Ariel Shearer, Liz Pelly, and um, we had a couple of people sort of <laughs> doing that they literally around the clock. Um, Farone's coverage was amazing of that. Um, but you remember, there, was, there were other reporters there. There were Globe reporters there. They just didn't, I mean, it's not like they didn't know about it. Um, they, and not only that, I mean, Steve Neer was covering it for, for the Metro um, and actually probably doing the best mainstream job of, of any of the mainstream papers, just to kid out you who's interested in there. Um, the, I'll throw another one out there, which was, you know, that it, in the very final days of the Phoenix, um, when Stevenson's climate coverage, which is a very mainstream issue, but the way that he was covering that, I think, was pretty distinctive and had uh, kind of a, a, a different kind of impact um, where he's talking about, um, you know, essentially a mainstream climate, you know, environmentalist movement that is moving off into um, into a, a mode of radical action. Right. Um, and I, I, that he came to us. You know, you're talking about a guy who'd written for the Atlantic, who'd written for Globe Idea Section, who had been at GBH and WBR, and um, and could not get anybody else to publish that stuff. So yeah, there's still stuff. I was. Go ahead, Chris. Oh. This is Chris. Just step up to the mic. Um, just so, because this is recorded, and then we'll have you for posterity. <laughs> it's not just Chris. Uh, just yeah. identify yourself. Uh, Chris Ferone. So I came on staff in uh, so, uh, exactly five years, September two thousand eight. 
Um, but it's, it wasn't just covering the same stuff other people are covering in a different way. But there's there's just a, there's a million, I think your your question is there's still a million stories in Boston. I still have a book full of shit that I didn't get to write for the Phoenix and trying to do some you know all over the place. There's still cults, literally on college campuses. You know uh, Larouche houses. If you, it, so if and, you brought that story, if you brought a story of a cult on a college campus to Boston Magazine. <clears throat> um, or uh, or to the Globe, uh, you know, to the ideas section, or would do you think they would Globe say would ah, we're not interested in that? I don't really, I don't mess with the Globe. But otherwise, it's like uh, um, only because uh, uh, they know who I am at this point. But if you know, if if you're a young writer out there who's going to come out and you have like a badass story, I mean, it probably will get stolen. Um, uh, so you, you're just better off at doing it's, it for an independent not, outlet. I mean, I guess my point was, it's not that they wouldn't run it. They wouldn't, and if, you know, they'd water it down or whatever. As far as, I mean, the way that we got to do stuff at the Phoenix is really not another outlet where you can get paid. The, I mean, I traveled. Right. I was that's on the, the road for four months a year. Like, is just like, he's an alt-weekly reporter. That's what, that's what they look like, and they don't... There's, there's they, still they a lot of stories. That's for all. Other pe they don't get to write for other people. The look stays, by the way, in case you didn't notice. That. <laughs> <laughs> the salaries go up a little bit, but the look stays. He's a, he's a maniac. I mean, like, there's, he's just... Yeah. Like the way that he because reports stories, the way that he writes. I, I, I agree. Like, that no, we need to start talking about the fact that paper and is is. Um, I have a twenty-seven-year-old daughter who does not pick this up. Right. And she reads the New York Times. That, that's because it's not in existence uh, anymore. She doesn't well, pick up the. She reads the New York Times. She does not read the paper. New I don't York read the New York Times. Times right? and, 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 and so I think that's. I mean, there's room. The question is, how do we? create a Phoenix-like world with editors who can help people and where readers can find this stuff on the internet. And that's where it has to go. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of stirring like that. And oddly enough, in my other life as a sports writer, there's a couple of sites that are doing long-form sports reporting with a fully edited. Glenn Stout, who many of you may know from, uh, he runs the best American sports writing. He has a, a, a I think it's called, I think it's called Wordplow or something, which is a long-form journalism site. Uh, ESPN.com is doing a lot of long form. Uh, what I do basically is I print the stories out and then read them in hard copy because I'm an old guy. <laughs> but so there, I mean, at least uh, in those, and, and somebody's doing a long form political site now, and I can't remember who it is. I just re I read about it the other day uh, nationally. Can I make one? I'll make one other comment about the Phoenix sort of as a, as a Boston institution, as a, a you know, removed from all the alt weekly stuff. Um, you know, that this is something that. This, it was a, a thing that you picked up on, the week, on Thursdays or, you know, in the old days on Fridays. And it was like the Bible of what was going on in Boston. And, and, it, and it had everything in it. And I, the, yes, it's been disaggregated by the internet, but there isn't anything that anybody started in Boston of any of the websites that you pick up and yeah. you can find out what bands are playing and what bands are good and what theater's playing and what you should be thinking about and what books to read. And that, that I mean, obviously that this is not like, this is not rocket science, but when the thing goes away, you start to miss it. Um, and I was sort of shocked that even, you know, I would sort of like, it's like having a phantom limb. You're like, you should, you're looking for this thing that you're like, I wait, I know but, where to find that, but it's not. I, I, I was right after the marathon bombings. I actually, I knew the Phoenix didn't exist. But the thought that came into my mind is, it's Thursday, I have to go pick up the Phoenix because I really want to read something meaningful about that event, which everyone was covering. Right. You know, to argue with Anita a little bit about nostalgia, <laughs> there, you know, there was a period in Boston theater in the late 60s and early 70s where you could go to the Loeb Drama Center and see Tommy Lee Jones as Coriolanus and Stockard Channing as Isabella in Measure for Measure or Jenny in uh, Three Penny Opera. Uh, John Lithgow was acting in and directing plays. This was a period of about seven years. There's been nothing Nothing in Boston like that since then. There was Sarah Caldwell doing amazing productions of operas that the Met hadn't quite heard of yet, though they figured it out later. We were getting amazing productions of, you know, of th that was that were revelations. Um, Robert Lowell was 
in Boston teaching at Harvard. And there's nothing like that. And, these, and the Phoenix is sort of in, Phoenix had a really great run. And it's horrible that it doesn't exist anymore. It's so sad that it doesn't exist anymore. But it's one of those things that is really irreplaceable. And I, and I think, you know. We, we could talk about the ART and what they're doing, um, which I think is pretty impressive these days. But uh, I, do wanna, I do wanna move on um, and make sure we get to the audience part of this. We have thumbs down for the ART. <laughs> we have, we have, okay. Um, uh, argue about the, let's argue about theater. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, so let's move on. Um, oh, one thing I did just want to, and, and when we were talking about um, some of the Phoenix's coverage, uh, I just wanted to, to point out um, one incredibly impressive piece of reporting. The fact that it's 10 years ago does not at all mean that this stopped over the last 10 years, but um, one of the things the Globe gets credit for, a huge amount of credit for, is its coverage of, um, of the Catholic Church uh, in, in, in the early part of the last decade. Um, and this was a story that Phoenix was writing about for months before the Globe picked it up. Um, uh, so it, it, here was a story, I don't know if the Globe would or would not have come upon it, um, but it certainly was a story that, that, uh, that the Phoenix was at first. It's too bad Harvey's not here. I should have oh. reached out to him. Anyway, yes, please, and please identify yourself. Sure, I'm Mark Tomizawa, and <clears throat> I grew up in Chicago, so the Chicago Reader, which is still going, um, and WFMT, which was an all-classical station with people um, who spoke their minds rather well. Um, I, I wanted to add, I didn't want this to feel like a funeral. That's um, tomorrow. Yeah, it's <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. That, that's tomorrow at 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Because here's what I'm going to say. The old Keep. English expression, I think, is the difference between a grave and a rut is dimension. You've talked about lots of structural things. I think it's not nostalgic to say what part of the structure is universal and goes way back to the best of narrative, and how does that structure come to life on, come to life on the internet? And I'd like to suggest that with a certain man buying the globe, and with the amazing talent we have in Boston, including the dean of BU's communications department, who made the Herald Digital, that we have the people. All right, I, I, I saw the little grimace. See, we may have a difference of opinion about what happened, but I'm just saying that Boston has this urge to become great again. All right, technically, we lost it to Silicon Valley. We've given it away twice. Wait, let's make, I just want to make sure that there's a question because there, we have a lot of very opinionated there, people in the audience. No, no, there is, but this is all structure and this is opportunity, okay? I, this is not pathological. So the idea is this. We go to John Henry and say, you need to create a new version of whatever it is. You need an alt version of the globe, and you've got the people who can do it. I, okay, what but what is the question? That is. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to... I'm well, tr I, actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question. The, um, and it's, it's, the, the because irony is that, that that's essentially what Boston.com hired me to do um, when I got when, after, right after the Phoenix died. Um, and, um, and they'll be launching a site that is something like that probably mid-October. And does it, last question, does it include really talented people like him and the younger versions of him? It damn well better. But there's no guarantee that it will. No, I mean, and, and but there, I mean, there, and there, but it'll there's invite no it. There, and, and there's no guarantee that even if it does, it'll succeed. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there, the, the question is, is there an opportunity? And yeah, there's an enormous opportunity there. There's an opportunity for the dig. There's, an, there's another All Weekly in town. And, and, um, and there's an opportunity for um, Boston Magazine. Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so I just hope that MIT will be a big player in that because MIT has I, I the ability. I can almost guarantee that MIT will not be a big player in starting a Although, new Although, oddly media enough, I mean, what, <laughs> no, 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 no. In, you in, say that, but, the, but in when setting we the structure were, up. I was going to say, okay. In, um, isn't in that what Joey Ito is talking about now? Is spreading out the media lab to the rest of the world? So, isn't Alt a way of innovating? Okay. I'm just trying that, to get. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we do, I mean, it, in. Um, in trying to think about like whether there would be a place online for for some new kind of thing with a lot of the same kinds of people who are, who were doing stuff at the Phoenix, um, uh, we did talk to we talked to the MIT 
game lab actually. Um, Manny was involved in those. And I hope they. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm distanced from that from that process at this point, obviously. But um, but it's ongoing, and I think um, I think there's an opportunity for anybody who wants to who really cares about that stuff. Um, you also, I think, uh, all of us on this stage and a lot of people who are here have a, 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 um, a sense, just an innate sense, of what an enormous job that is to do on a week-to-week -week basis. It's easy to do for a little while, mm -hmm. but it's hard to do for 40 years. I think that's one of the lessons of the dig. Um, and it, uh, I know everybody has differing opinions on, on Stephen Mendich, who kept us in the game for 46 years. But he made extraordinary contributions um, of money and of time and of... Um, and lots of other stuff um, over the years, and and the, and the, uh, yeah, John Henry's definitely you know one of those sort of rich people who can subsidize the thing, but um, those people are pretty are pretty rare now. Um, my my, my point about that guaranteeing that MIT was not going to do that, I, I didn't mean MIT was not going to um, help create new structures. MIT is not going to go and work with the globe on bringing a Phoenix-like uh, um, outlet to Boston.com or the Globe. Why? Uh, I, don't, I don't think. It doesn't matter well, because I'm has... not in a position to make that, and you can ask Joey if you want to. Okay, I will. All right, thanks. Yes. A um, couple of uh, thoughts for your consideration C questions. Let's make sure it's a question. Yeah, they're, they're questions. Um, the, when you, you, you touched on what I think is most important, the, the, the Phoenix started as Boston After Dark. It started as what you described, a kind of calendar at listing. Um, and so it seems to me that was always the core, at least what, it, what I liked about the Phoenix, uh, when it, the Phoenix bought, you know, that whole complicated history. Um, so I guess, number one, isn't there a place, and I think you touched on it a little, for a uh, hard copy version of something you pick up on a weekly basis that has all the music and the lectures and everything else, w what I found useful about the Phoenix. Secondly, the Phoenix went from being... Let's, th let's make sure there's a question. Yeah, d d don't worry. Just well, you're already on number two. Yeah, okay, well, if you listen, I think you'll hear it. Um, okay. I think the first one was, now here's the second. Um, the Phoenix went down a road that I completely horrified me, um, and I think it was sort of self-destruction when it switched over from the, the paper version into this glossy thing with this whole new advertising strategy, which turned it into the yuppie extraordinaire publication, which I had no interest in whatsoever. Maybe there's a new market out there that, but I evidently didn't respond. No one, I don't think, has talked yet about that particular thing that happened, which led directly to the demise of that version of the publication. And the link to that question is, I just came back from Maine a short while ago, and there's a Portland version of the Phoenix that's still going. Yeah, it's right here. And there's a, and there's a Providence version, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So why is it, I don't, you know, no one has really explained how it's possible to have a Phoenix in Portland, unless I missed it at the very beginning think, of this. Car Carly, you might, I know you might have something to say about this, but I think that's something that you see actually around the country uh, in that smaller communities are having a much easier time sustaining out weeklies than large cities because uh, what what alt weeklies are giving um, truly cannot be found in those cities. You see it um, throughout the South. You see it in Portland. Where's you see it in Providence? I guess. Still I would. I mean, the, we, the, what you're talking about is, I think, pretty pretty accurate. And this is one of the things um, that I, I, I've mentioned a, f a few times in, in different contexts. But um, I was on the, the the board of directors for the uh, the alternative weekly group, which is all like there's like 150 of them in the country, and it is one of the things that, that you, one of the trends you see is that the big city ones, um, you know, the Village Voice is a wreck right now. Um, the Phoenix obviously is dead, um, but in the small and medium markets, a lot of those papers are becoming almost papers of record. I, and the the couple that I that I tend to mention, one is um, Seven Days in Vermont, which is a fantastic paper and growing and doing great stuff, um, and. Um, What's the one in, in Jackson, Mississippi? I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna forget the, the name of it. But there's a there's also there's a couple of really good ones. Um, and and so yeah, I mean the, you know I, I definitely I mean I heard believe me you're not the first person to say that that they hated the glossy version. Um, we disagree. I mean I, I thought it was a great a great magazine and um, and um, you know there one of the things that I think I I, I personally underestimated um, when we went to the glossy was that the Phoenix represented not just um, what was there, because we, we went through great effort to keep long form journalism in it, to keep all the, to actually add to our arts coverage, um, and, to, and to make a space for all the things that made the Phoenix the Phoenix. Um, but it made, it made perfect sense to me after, afterwards that people responded to, to the Phoenix as being some, what was not there. I mean, the part of what, what it meant to be this newspaper version of the Phoenix was that it wasn't 
on glossy paper, and that it, and it didn't have these gorgeous, pretty pictures. Um, and there's a, there was a grittiness to it that, that certainly was lost, although um, I can tell you that inside that newspaper, there were a lot of us who were really excited to have the opportunity to do the magazine version. I also miss Cyprus. <laughs> David? I, I wonder if I could ask the panel to... Please, uh, please, please identify I, yourself. I, I'm sorry. I'm David Thorburn, the director of the Communications Forum. Uh, I, I, this is very rich, interesting discussion, but I, I, I'm listening to it partly as an, as an outsider. And I think that one problem with the discourse so far has been that the people who are... Uh, Phoenix writers and Phoenix uh, uh, long-time Phoenix readers certainly know what everyone is alluding to, but for those of us who have a less full sense of what the issues are, it isn't entirely clear what's so alternative about what you've described. One, here's one thing I got, I'm sure is right, that there was a much greater and more systematic and respectful emphasis on what we'll call popular culture, and that the Phoenix, like other alternative weeklies or non-mainstream publications, helped to naturalize the notion now very widespread that these distinctions are unhelpful. Uh, that seems so. One thing I, is clear to me that one thing that distinguished the uh, Phoenix in its in its heyday, at least, was this kind of emphasis. Uh, but but uh, what in other and then another thing that. You, uh, you're telling us distinguished it was the quality of its contributors and its writing, which of course I accept and understand. And in fact, my experience with the Phoenix certainly confirms that tremendously so. Uh, um, but still, what else about the Phoenix made it so alternative? What really distinguished it from uh, the Globe or from other right. things? And, and have we really, are, are there no other spaces online where such things are available? Two things I can think of right off the bat. First of all, George Kimball. Mm. Nobody wrote about sports the way George Kimball did anywhere in America. I mean, it, it, if, if anybody I, during my time at the Phoenix can be said to have reinvented a form of journalism, it was George Kimball. Uh, simply by leaving the press box. Uh, I would think, I think you could say the same thing about Dave O'Brien. At that point, nobody was covering the media in Boston as a beat. People had done media criticism before going back to you know, Liebling and Mencken and everyone else. Nobody else was doing that uh, at the time. Uh, those, those, those are two that, those are so, two. So part, those of, part of the point, Charlie, is the, is the, uh, the uh, uh, boldness and, and, and uh, uh, non-mainstream interests of the, of the, of the, of the writers. In other words, no, was it, also, it was also non-mainstream style. It was also non-mainstream vocabulary. It was also, I mean, everything about the two that I mentioned, and I hope most of the work the rest of us did, was everything about it was alternative, except for the basic journalism, as Anita said, which was always solid. But the approaches to stories, the discovery stories, I remember to this day, in 1980, right before I left, 82, 83, we had a terrific writer named Neil Miller, and he kept coming to me, or coming to, to meetings, with this story about this weird disease that gay men were getting and were dying of. And even at the Phoenix, people weren't, didn't see the story. I mean, it was just this kind of strange thing. But, but Neil dogged it. And I, mean, and, 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 and I don't know that the Globe, has had, the Globe had anybody on it then. But it wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the, 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 the approach that was alternative. It was the, it was the way we, did, we, we all did our jobs in a, in a fashion that was the alternative to what was then the mainstream. Would you and say I, can't, I can't explain it to well, you without taking you back to what the Globe was. I was, was there say, a and what the Globe still is. I think, you know, Charlie's got a, a, a real, a, a great perspective on this, having been at a bunch of these places for significantly longer than, than the rest of us have. But um, even to get a peek inside what uh, a daily newspaper is like and the strictures that are put on that, in many ways, they're, they're, I mean, there, there are lots of great things that the Globe is able to do, but there's just, there, there are patently things that they cannot do and don't wish to do that, you know, that, le that so, left so, open a, a, a vast spectrum of... So of part of it is, are, then is, are, are the oppressive standards of, of convention and taste that keep the mainstream media from looking at certain kinds of questions. Not entirely. Well, I mean, wait a minute, because I did get to write, and so did you, at the yeah. magazine at the sure. Globe, when, they were, when we were given the opportunity to stretch out. And at Boston Magazine, when I worked for Dave O'Brien, I, and I wrote about the AIDS epidemic and early on, and, um, and was given a lot of time as well as space to fill those things out. So it's, it's not just the outlets, it's also the fact that all of our print 
everything is shrinking so much. You can't do that anymore in the Globe magazine. There's just no space and there's no time. There's no money to pay the reporters. And so that's it's so it's not just the media outlet. It's it's what's happened to journalism and to our and to paper in the last Yes, yeah, so in other words, what you're what you're doing, you're linking the demise of the of of the Phoenix in part to the yes. tremendous transformations Absolutely. that were all, it certainly makes all right. sense. Let, yes. It and is. Please make sure you identify yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Reka Murthy. Um, I'm actually a CMS alum from far too long ago now. <laughs> Hi, David. Um, so I heard Chris talk about all the stories that he still has left to be told. And I heard Anita talk about how do you create a phoenix online. And I'm in the public radio space where um, local more and more gets talked about as a differentiator for stations that otherwise can be bypassed by all sorts of other channels besides broadcast for the same national programs. Um, however, I feel like local media doesn't get respect when it comes down to it. And, and I'm not just saying that in public radio, I think in general. And what I'd love to hear from all of you is... When you say respect, do you mean within the industry or from both, an audience? Both, I think. Okay. I mean, obviously, this is all anecdotal. Um, but that's why I want to hear from you guys. What I want to hear is, when you were at the Phoenix, what were your perceptions? I mean, it's all anecdotal. It's very qualitative. I mean, you can bring circulation in if that's useful. But I want to get a sense not of how advertisers felt about advertising in the Phoenix, but I want to get a sense from you guys of how you felt the community and appetite among the readers and among the Boston scene, um, the movers and shakers as well as the alts. Um, what was the appetite for local media, for talking about it, for reading about it, for even knowing that there were local stories? I mean, that's another issue. And, we were talking and about how do you see that over history? I want to talk about yeah. and and but the, Can you radio. also bring in the internet too, because there's such a perception now that there's so much media and there's too much of it. Yeah. But obviously, there's so many stories that aren't getting told. So just over time, I'd love to hear what you think. I'm really big on local media, on local radio. I'm, and everybody I know talks about it all the time. Um, and the local outlets, um, Lloyd and I were talking about the very long report we heard in the car today about the opera. That's, this new opera This company. new opera thing. That's, I would never in a million years know about that, nor would I necessarily read about it. I'm and not sure that, that was, I would turn to that. Was that on BUR? On BUR. Um, and the kind of the kind of arts reporting they're doing there, the kind of local reporting they're doing, there, and also on GBH. Although, anyway, um, <laughs> I, I really think the BUR report, the reporting is really it's it's quite interesting. And some of the other, you know, um, I'm also a new big fan of Tell Me More, which is a national uh, show. I'm so glad you just said that it, because I walk around saying how great that and is, underplayed it is. Yes, it, and <laughs> this is um, this is a show about minority voices and that brilliant uh, hostess and uh, and I did said that because you should know it's a woman and um, and this great barbershop thing on Fridays it's just it's terrific so I'm actually very excited about local radio and and then in terms of the audience it's all anecdotal it's all you know it's how many letters did you get how many emails did you get what's the response but it's just in terms of the chatter I actually think that that local radio is where it's happening. That's what, about what about and local news? What about a culture around that. local news and people's expectations for it, reading it, prioritizing it? Are they going to read the Globe or are they going to read the next national <coughs> political website? I think that's what I want, not just local I, radio. I'm still hungry for the, for the Globe website, or not the Globe, web, somebody to do a local website. And I don't, and the Thursday afternoon thing doesn't do it for me because if it's Tuesday, I want to know what's, uh, you know, things change. So I want, I want a website that does Boston After dark and I want it to be really good and I want it to have reviews on it and it you know and so it needs somebody needs to aggregate that for the city of Boston for the for the for the greater Boston area my follow-up would be you guys did it in print obviously you did it in a di in various different contexts how might one do it in the future? Because you guys are online. among the few who succeeded. <laughs> do it online. It's got to be done online. It's got to be done online. Right, but, but with, how? With, 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 I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what are the elements? <laughs> you got to ask, I think just ask by, somebody by, else. By, by constraints of time, we're not going to have any business plans. Somebody um, in this room here. knows how. Somebody in this room knows how to do that, but, I'm but sure. I, I do have one follow-up, and I'm and, um, talking about Tell Me More, and uh, the focus on minority voices. Um, that's something that historically the Phoenix... Uh, had a varied record on in, in terms of representing. Um, uh, do any of you have any thoughts about why that is and what that says about an alternative weekly and about the alternative weekly culture um, that there was that varied record? Fight. 
It's white. Yeah. It's white. It, what, it's, what is it? The, the, the culture of the Phoenix that I knew was white. Yeah. It was white. That was it. There was, there was, whatever attempts so you, were made. So you had, you had this and There was nobody of color in there. I mean, I'm sorry, people. David. I'm sure somewhere in the history of the Phoenix there was a person of color. But in my four or five, Charlie? No. <laughs> you, had a, you had a community of people who had um, uh, a counterculture perspective who were College pushing educated, back against... Middle class. Against... Well, I mean, we, I, we, were, we, we, we covered a lot of stories mm -hmm. out of the different communities in yeah. Boston. But we did so as... as yeah. Anita said, a pretty white paper. But we did, I mean, there's certainly Dave O'Brien's work on the James Bowden case, uh, which I don't know if anybody remembers now. But we, I mean, we were, we, we were out there covering stories, as we were everywhere, that other people weren't getting to. It's just that the composition of the staff was the way it was. And that's why, and one of the, I wrote a, I wrote a blog about the voices on, on, on NPR and the names on NPR. Just saying Meghna Chakrabarty makes me feel good. Um, and all of those names, um, all, of the, all of the names of, uh, who, who I can't identify necessarily where they came from. I think that's, that's a tremendous shift in, in what we're hearing um, on the air, and I think that's really exciting. So I, I'm really looking forward to what happens with, um, with radio, and I'm, hope, and I'm hoping it will stay local to that, to that extent, too. It's exciting. But, but just br bringing it back to the Phoenix, why, you know, we have people here who collectively were at the paper for decades and decades. Um, was that a discussion that you had? And if not, why not? I think it's a. Yeah, it was a. My God, Bill Miller and I went. That's why I asked the question. That's why I asked the question. I think it was it was constant, not just for not just for the Phoenix, but for all weeklies in general. Um, it, the the Jackson Free Press, which is the one I was trying to think of in in Jackson, Mississippi, is the only alt weekly I know. It was a, it was started online and then became a, a print paper um, that has um, a, a, a racially diverse. Um, <laughs> Staff. staff and and as well as readership um, you know I th th but I think, I think the other thing to remember is that that at the time there were and this is certainly no excuse but at the time there was a thriving black press news press yeah. around the country I mean there was a lot of the good talent went to they the Amsterdam went to the Amsterdam News in New York or or the banner here or or the Chicago Defender and there was radio uh, that, that was still a lot that was still was a, that radio. was still a lot that was that was still alive Charlie, back then. black radio stations I'm sure. local local stations WLD WLD I mean there was a universe of African American media that was still thriving at that point uh, which I which is no excuse which is no excuse for the you know for what, yeah. for the way we were but that that's the fact uh, yes. Hi, I'm Carolina Donovan from the Neiman Journalism Lab, um, and I'm sorry to go back to all of these things, but I did kind of want to talk about a paid model for for long form and for magazine writing and for narrative. And I mean, we've introduced some of those examples, Grantland, some other things, um, and maybe there is no answer. Maybe the answer is not in this room right now. But we we've talked about the web a little bit, and in terms of unbundling that. So I'm not talking about local. I'm not talking about listings. Not even necessarily talking about Boston. But if we're talking about making the kind of the, the really the meat of the writing that you guys did profitable um and obviously you said you're still doing it charlie you said you're still doing it and getting paid for it presumably um where and, and how is that happening and how can we make well it I'm, not, I'm not i'm not doing long form online i'm doing a blog for esquire and a 1500 word column for grantland that's not what i i don't consider that long form uh the stuff i do for the the, the for esquire magazine is what i consider long form and i'm still doing that for print uh, I just mentioned that I know a couple of people, and I can't remember who's doing. Somebody is launching a political website of, with long-form political journalism, and I heard about it while I was in Washington the last couple of days, and I can't remember. It's somebody fairly famous, but, I mean, and part, I can't remember who it is. But in any, in any event, Glenn Stout is doing it in sports writing right now. Part of the genius of the Alt Weeklies was, I mean, uh, the, and you hear this constantly across all kinds of journalism, that, that the long-form stuff has traditionally not been thought of as stuff that pays the bills. Mm -hmm. um, so this was sort of, you know, the, the idea of it being that Bible, the street Bible, the thing that people would pick up, um, the, the business model for all weeklies was you had this audience of, you know, 18 to 36-year-olds who, like, had disposable time and disposable income and just really wanted to go out and, and be involved in the cultural life of the city. Um, and if you could have this thing that everybody wanted to pick up and read because of all the, you know, essentially this great you know, rock writing and it's great, like, you know, but they read the ads the same way that they read the, co the, the copy, um, that you could afford to, ha to build all the space 
that made room for all the stuff that we we love to do. What do we get paid? And, and, Excuse and me, talking about man monetizing. Oh, what were you? What were we paid? Not a lot. We were, <laughs> we were paid it nothing. wasn't. Well, I mean, it wasn't a lot, but it was something. It was something. That was the point. That was the point. That's the point. point. It wasn't yeah. enough to live on. It's also sure. for more than for more than a couple. of years. I mean, years. it was enough for me to li live on. Believe it or not, in Jamaica Plain. Yeah. But, oh, it five years. Years. Okay. but it was yeah. <laughs> not today. Is one of the reasons that there was so much turnover at the Phoenix. Right. Exactly. Because <laughs> yeah. you no, know, because there was a kind of ceiling. We were to fairly easily outbid, is what Lloyd is saying. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the, I don't know what you were paying. Har Harvey the Harvey Silvergate wow. um, actually wrote about this and how he went to uh, Steve Mindich, the publisher, at one point and said, "Look, you know, we could build this stable of all-time great writers if we just paid them more." And Steve, according to Harvey flipped his lid and uh, you know essentially said I'm not going to tell you how to practice law you don't tell me how to publish my paper um, but uh, uh, I guess Harvey's impression was that one of the one of the things that Stephen eventually said to him in conversation one of the lessons there was that there if you pay people a comfortable wage then you don't get that constant infusion of new talent. Um, <laughs> I think it was a pain. It was a pain in the neck, but it was sort of understood. It could be a publisher's yeah. way of yeah. justifying paying people a non-livable wage. However, it is worth pointing out that you know you were there for five years. And, and you <laughs> it was left, graduate and you, school. Yeah, it was graduate school. It was not a plan. But so I, I think it does speak to this just a second because of, about monetizing it. So we, we were given the chance and the opportunity, and in exchange, in exchange for not getting paid a lot, we were, we were given great editors, and we, you know, we, we understood that there was an exchange there. Um, I don't know how that works um, online, and I don't know if it still works, but... Well, um, well Ariana Huffington has discovered enough to pay anybody to anything pay at all, so I mean... Yeah. How it could work online, so... Um, so, I mean, the, the, you know, again, I, the nostalgia here has <laughs> to be tempered with mm -hmm. what we were getting paid and what we weren't getting paid and why people had to leave because and, they didn't, and, you, some people had to have psych, had real jobs and then they wrote for the Phoenix, right? Like me. Like you. Yeah. yeah. Like. There, there. Um, I mean, there are. The, this isn't the topic of this forum, but there are places like the Atavist and, and Byliner that are only publishing long form, you know, five to fifteen thousand word pieces, and uh, have an economic model um, that involves paying for those pieces. It, who knows if that'll work, but certainly the also, writers... Um, there's also a journalist in the back of the room, Mara Johnson, who's do, sort of pioneering the model of just sort of having your own like online magazine, like that is on your iPod. And like you know, it's in the iTunes store, and like then you assign your friends stories, and you know, and people pay you for a subscription to that. Sure, and I can't um, remember the name of the. It might be what you're talking about, but someone is doing an, an ebook single thing right now out of Esquire. It's Esquire Editors. I think I they're using remember. the Kindles. They're using yeah. like a Kindle single kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, yeah. David. Oh, let's go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I can. Yes. Uh, my name is David Rosenbaum. Uh, the question was raised: What what made the Phoenix alt? Uh, I walked into the Phoenix in 1973, 23 years old, and they said, okay, write something and we'll pay you. Now, I couldn't have walked into the New York Times. <laughs> I couldn't have walked into the Village Voice. Village Voice was too scary. Uh, been around for a long time. Couldn't walk into the Herald. But I could walk into the Phoenix, and they may not have paid a lot. I think they paid me $75. But seventy-five dollars is more than I get paid online. 35. I remember getting. I remember getting thirty-five actually. Well, I'm, a few years later, so. I think it was the, hot. At the, uh, at the end, we were paying <laughs> what thirty-five bucks for a record review. Well, this was a this was one fifty for a half page book review. Thirty. We cut it Instead down. Instead of well, let's, we don't need to revisit all. Of okay, but right, the point is, journalists. I don't know where I have a a friend's son who is now an editor at Slate. And basically what he does is edit stuff that people write for free and put it up. And because it's the web and it's in, you got to fill in an infinite amount of space. You talk about long form. You got to <laughs> fill an infinite amount of space constantly. I don't, you can't pay these people. What? So the validation I got from that 75 bucks, I'm sorry, Anita. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> allowed me to say, okay, I can maybe do this. This might be a, a profession for me. I don't know where that exists, but that, at that time, was what made it alternative, is that it was a place for not a journalism person, 
you know, just somebody off the street with a college education, to say, why don't I try writing? And then I got support for it. All right, we're going to move into um, a lightning round where you all need to answer as many questions as possible in 60 seconds or less. Uh, I guess there are not a lot of wait, wait, don't tell me listeners in the audience. Um, but uh, we do only have um, 15 minutes left, so we are going to try and keep questions and answers even more succinct than usual so we can get to everyone. Um, and a reminder that there will be a reception afterwards so we can continue uh, this kind of, yes, I'll make the announcement. I'll, I'll remind everyone right before we go and where it is, but we can continue this discussion uh, there as well. Yes. Hi, uh, Kelly Kreitz with CMS. Uh, I want to pick up on, on something that came up in David's question, but also has been a little bit of an underlying theme in what a lot of you have said, which is um, this idea of your writing having been a craft. That word came up a lot, and, and, and the idea that what was really alternative about the Phoenix was the quality of the writing or the art. Um, or the craft, to use your word, um, which is a really different kind of conversation about what might be, quote, lost um, if, as journalism changes than I've heard in um, other communications forums, for example, when we're maybe talking with journalists who represent mainstream outlets. Um, and one thing that makes me think is that, um, you know, for thinking about the, the, the craft of the writing as part of what made what you were doing alternative and part of what you want to try to you know, see what that future might be in digital media. Um, it, it puts the Phoenix into a kind of history that, I mean, there, there's a history of alternative spaces in print that goes beyond journalism. So it makes me, you've talked about new journalism, which sort of walked the line between literature and, and journalism in the 1970s, but also literary magazines in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And it makes me think that, you know, you could argue, well, there's a history that has to do with changes in media technologies of, of a sort of shifting line between the way we think about the literary and the journalistic. Um, and so maybe there's, there's, a, there's a future for something like the Phoenix that isn't within the realm of professional journalism. Maybe it is, you know, some new way of thinking about the literary or another kind of art space. So I'm just, I think I'm asking maybe for you to talk a little bit more about this artistic side of, of, of what the Phoenix represented. Well, and, and is there another place perfect, to look perfect, for perfect, where perfect. it could... You, you want to first? Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me just g give you a, 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 a little anecdote. Um, this is about uh, Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, I think Lloyd is the only one on the panel who can speak with an expertise <laughs> here, I'm just telling you. I, I was going to say, between the five of us, we've won one. <laughs> but I, I, served, I served on the Pulitzer jury for a couple of years after I won my award. Uh, and I had um, a very interesting conversation with my fellow jurors. Uh, as far as I know, and, and I may be getting the numbers wrong, only three or four writers in my category have ever won a Pulitzer Prize in the history of the category uh, of criticism. And what do you mean in your category? Criticism. You mean, no. Category is criticism. The Pulitzer Prize in criticism. No, 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 no. Actually, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to make that more general. Only three or four. Only three or four Pulitzer Prize winners have ever won for working on an alternative weekly, right. for working on a weekly. When I was a juror, I was um, blown away by an art critic uh, for the LA Weekly who seemed to me to be transforming the nature of art criticism and who is an absolutely brilliant writer. And in the discussion that, you know, we went through to choose the three finalists, uh, I said something like, this guy is the best writer of the 1,100, you know, you know uh, contenders that we saw. And s one of my uh, colleagues on the jury, who was a managing editor of a major daily newspaper, said... You can say who it is. Uh, no, I'm not going to say who it is. Uh, but not from here, not from Boston, uh, does, doesn't matter, uh, said, 
I'm not interested in good writing. I'm interested in someone who can fill that space every day. And I was totally outvoted. The person that I thought was, you know, should have won the prize and certainly should have been a finalist wasn't even considered. It was totally outvoted by the other jurors. But that, who, that who, sounds like a philosophical question about whether a Pulitzer Prize winner for criticism should be someone who has to file every day or whether if you write three columns and, and they're the best columns, you can submit those. But in terms of your question about craft, right, and... and yeah, I, I want to... The difference, to answer your question, the difference at the Phoenix for me was editors. There's one thing that drives me freaking crazy about daily newspapers, absolutely out of my fucking mind, is a newspaper, a newspaper, a newspaper <laughs> will promote a writer to be an editor. That's like promoting a gardener to be a plumber. I know, ed I know brilliant editors. I've had brilliant editors. I married a brilliant editor. I can't edit copy. Everything I edit comes out sounding like me, and we know how writers just love that. Uh, it's a different skill set. It's, diff it's a different calling. It's a different craft, to use the word. And I think that the first place I learned that was at the Phoenix, was that there were people who, you know, frankly, I wrote better than they did. But boy, they edited much better. I mean, it was just, when you gave them your thing, it came back to you in your voice, looking better than it did. But the ability to do that, to work the craft of editing within the writer's voice, without losing the writer's voice, I mean, that, that to me is as distant from my ability as flying the space shuttle. I don't know how anyone does it. Though some of those editors were terrific writers. I was about to say, I was yeah. going to say, I was thinking of Cliff, when, you know, yeah. who was an amazing writer as well as a great editor. But I think that's, well, the, in terms of the craft, that's what, that's what differentiated the Phoenix <coughs> for me as a place where, you know, I wasn't completely starting out there, but it was really the first place I really, I always felt like I spread my wings. It was because I, I, I developed an appreciation and, and a de through demonstration of the craft of editing. Yeah. Um, three blindingly fast comments. But, and, then and just identify yourself first. Scott Muncy. And uh, three blindingly fast comments and then one extraordinarily succinct question. Um, first of all, in terms of the economics of way back then, I love to torment 20-somethings about with my $350 a month two-bedroom apartment in Cambridgeport rent control. It was vastly cheaper and easier to live and to be independent and to do no your own thing back then. Yes. <laughs> Two, uh, Globe versus the Phoenix, what is alternative? Um, one of the most important aspects of that is where is the money coming from? I mean, you know, the Globe had filenes and, you know, major national accounts and all sorts of stuff. You know, where did the money come from for the Phoenix? That certainly wasn't all of it, but it had a major impact on the difference between the two publications. Um, the only reason, number three, I visit Esquire magazine online every single damn day is Charlie Pierce. Oh. And there, that <laughs> should be an example, and there should be money in that for the people that can do that for publications. So, you know, they should, I mean, the writers and also uh, the online publications should be looking into monetizing good journalism in that fashion. So here's the extraordinarily succinct question. Earlier, Anita was talking about curation, websites that bring together good folks, and then Charlie imme immediately started talking about, um, you know, how you guys had great editors back in the day. And I was wondering, do you guys have any examples of any current websites that provide good editorial nurturing for uh, journalistic writers online now? There must be I, some. I think Josh Marshall does a great job at Talking Points Memo. He's been doing it for a while. Uh, I think Politico could be, but it's not. I think Politico is, uh, one thing about Politico uh, is a tremendous, it is a tremendous lost opportunity because it could be exactly what you're talking about, and it's not. Uh, I will leave the floor there's, open for any other there's, examples. There's, the, the, it seems to me the best of the online Boston arts reviews is the Arts Fuse, which is Bill Marx's oh. website. Wow. And I think there, is, there's, there seems to be very good editing. There are some very good writers. 
there would be more good writers if anyone was getting paid. So, and and the, 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 those long form, the long form only outlets uh, have some excellent, excellent editors there, some refugees from Wired and The New Yorker, uh, and they put an enormous, I haven't written for them, but know a lot of people who have, and they put an enormous amount of effort um, into <laughs> editing those 10 and 15,000 word pieces. So I, maybe the I, sense I, I is in, that, that one other thing too, which is that you know I think if you look at what BUR has done online um, to sort of do some arts stuff over there, um, you know, I think there's a there's a possibility for that to, to become you know a bigger outlet. They've got some interesting you know they're a nonprofit. They've got some money. Um, they might be able to afford to pay some people, um, and there and there is that sort of institutional backing for for the arts there. Um, so I, that that could become you know a new base. For, for some of that stuff. One point I just want to I want to make sure we touch on or at least mention before we go, and that's something that um, Dan Kennedy was talking about here, and that's the effect that the collapse of the classified uh, market had on alt weeklies. Um, and uh, you know we can debate in retrospect the Phoenix's move to go free, but when they stopped charging and then no longer had the classifieds. Um, yeah, but we survived that. I mean, and not to not to say that that wasn't a, a blow, but it was a blow to regular newspapers as well. I don't think that alt weeklies were any more or less, you know. And in fact, there's a case to be made that we were less affected than than the dailies were, where the dailies were immediately cutting their circul or not their circulation, but their, but you know, where you saw 50% cuts in staff at, at dailies, that was out of the circulation stuff. And I'm, I'm sorry, out of the classified stuff, where the Phoenix did lose a lot of its classifieds. But I mean, that wasn't the blow that killed us. That was sort of the 2006 where you saw the paper get but it, smaller. But it, it would have been a blow that killed you if someone hadn't been subsidizing it. Um, I mean, I mean Stephen was losing a fair amount of money at the end. Well, and, and, and that's sort of that's the sort of Oz behind the curtain thing. So I, I don't have an, I don't have I can't tell you for sure that that's right or wrong. Right. Um, but I can tell you that um, that we weren't having discussions about the end of the newspaper in 2006, and we were having those like three years later um, when we'd sort of stable. It seemed to me at least that we had stabilized after the classifieds had gone away and, you know, sort of restructured around, you know, it was the, it was the drop, dropping out of national advertising, which is, which seemed to me to be the, the, the more of a body blow than the classified advertising. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. This will be very quick. My name is Fred Hapgood. I have one question. Why is it that the financial model for alternative newspapers seems more viable in smaller communities? Less competition. Yeah, there's really nobody else. Yeah. That, that was slow. That, that was absolutely. Yeah. That was, yeah. A, that was, yeah. That was a, yeah. a very succinct question, and I think the most succinct answer. <laughs> what smaller? No, just smaller pond, lower overhead, cheaper, yeah. less. Right. I mean, I wish we had gotten more people on the record for this. I just there's so many people I have questions for in this audience. So I hope you're all coming to this thing afterwards. Um. So that's probably as good a place uh, um, to wrap it up as any. We obviously could have continued this for many hours. Um, one of the ways we can continue it is by partaking of uh, crudités and wine and beer and assorted soft drinks. Um, I think technically starting at 7.30, but we can probably start heading over. Uh, um, that's at the R&D pub, which is on the fourth floor of the Stata Center. Uh, the Stata Center is the, um, uh, I guess, unique would be a nice way to phrase it, looking um, Frank Gehry building that is on Vassar Street. Uh, we will all be walking over there, so you can just sort of follow us. Um, I also want to point out the other two forums that we have scheduled um, for this semester, both of which should be really excellent. Uh, the first is on um, October 10th, uh, and that is with John Palfrey um, and Ethan Zuckerman, uh, and that's talking about how the generation born in the digital age is different from its analog ancestors. Um, and the second uh, is an entire forum just about long-form journalism, uh, what's going on with it and where it's going. Um, uh, looking specifically at The Atlantic, my colleague Tom Levinson will be moderating that, and Jim Fallows, uh, national correspondent from The Atlantic, will be there, as will his editor, uh, Corby Kummer, um, who in addition to being an editor, is, uh, is a food writer. But Corey, uh, I know from personal experience, is, is a really One excellent, time. excellent editor. That's on December 5th. I'll, I'll send you an email to... Yes. Um, so again, 
thank you all for coming. Uh, I do apologize that we didn't have time to get to everyone's questions, um, uh, but I hope as many of you as possible do join us afterwards. And I would really like to thank the four of you um, who, uh, uh, who put up with me um, for this and, uh, and, and sat here. I know you all had a lot more to say and we were limited in time, so it was excellent having you all. Um, and let's give them a big round of applause.